Hi all, this is a short webinar made by the MISO team dealing specifically with fishing strategies for sampling mesopelagic micronectar. To start off, let me just say that there is not likely to be one correct way of doing this, as distributions of the mesopelagic organisms vary quite a lot. To exemplify this, I've taken a figure from a 2014 study by a New Zealand group, where they've compared catches and acoustics studied the different acoustic signatures of different types of mesopelagic organisms. Panels A through J in the slide are echograms, a typical way of displaying data from echo sounders. Time or distance goes along the x-axis, while the y-axis show range, usually range to surface. The color on the echograms indicates the strength of the acoustic echo, with grey and blue colors indicating low strength and red colors strong echoes. As you see in the panels, there is quite a lot of variation in both vertical and horizontal characteristics of the distribution of these organisms, ranging from very diffuse distributions in both dimensions to very clumped or aggregated distributions. Here exemplified best by the dense schools of a species of the genus Marolicus visible in panel F. If the aim is to capture or identify distinct features on the echograms, the fishing strategy is of course pretty straightforward. You have to try to aim your device at these features while capturing as little as possible anywhere else. Here are a couple of more examples of echograms showing different spatial distributions of organisms encountered. In the left echogram, there are no areas of strong echoes, but a weak, diffuse scattering layer can be seen at depth from approximately 450 meters and downwards. In the right echogram, there's a mixture of components, with the distinct aggregation and being seen at intermediate depths, especially at the start of the echogram, that is on the left-hand side, whereas diffuse layers are found at depth and in the later parts of the echogram. If capturing on aggregations is desired, or on a distinct vertical layer to verify what its composition is, or because we suspect that the biomass levels are much higher there, then the trolls and nets will be aimed towards these features. Often, the aim is, however, to find out what animals inhabit the mesopelagic, and how many and how much biomass is in this vertical zone. So integrating holes aimed at sampling evenly over the zone are then used. One typical strategy is to use oblique uh, holes to achieve this, or double oblique holes if more sample volume is required, or if one wants to avoid stochasticity introduced by patchy distribution. This slide shows yet another four echograms covering 24 hour periods of vertical distribution in four North Atlantic basins. These are data collected during the Norwegian 2013 Eurobasin cruise and uh, was published a couple of years ago. The reason I include it is to highlight the profiles of acoustic backscatter from the mesopelagic, in this case at 38 kHz, most of the time shows distinct vertical zonation, with most of the backscatter originating from the so-called deep scattering layer. The strength of this DSL varies between the areas as does its center of gravity. It is also evident that the vertical distribution changes over the course of the day. And in practice, we in this study found that in situ light levels at the depth of the DSL determine the daytime depth. I just included these echograms to highlight that a troll targeting a deep scattering layer will have to take into account variations in the depth of this layer caused by factors that change the vertical distribution. This sounds like a very simple thing to do, but in practice I've participated in enough trolling activity to know that guiding the nets and trolls to an exact depth is usually achievable, but by the time you manage to get your net to that exact level, your scattering layer may be somewhere else. Here I've taken another echogram from another published paper, and you can clearly see in this uh, slide where the troll has been from the void in the echo layers. In this case, if the aim of the troll was to study the biota just below the strongest part of the deep scattering layer, the results would have been confounded by capture occurring both on the lowering and on the raising of the troll back to the surface. This is a well-known issue, 
and vessels often reduce forward speed during setting and retrieval of trawls and nets. But for scientific sampling, this problem is well worth remembering, as it means that as long as the trawl or net cannot be fully stopped from capturing, contamination from shallower depth horizons may well be an issue. For those of you that struggled through my lengthy presentation on quantifying the mesopelagic micronectin, you will know that I'm highly skeptical of cod end sampling devices. Devices that don't rely on cod end sampling are likely to give much better vertically stratified samples, as organisms tend to get stuck in the mesh along the net and are transported back towards the cod end at some later point in time, meaning that at the time taken for an organism to go from the mouth of the troll to the cod end can be highly variable. During the course of the MISO pro project, the IMR team has moved away from the use of hull-mounted acoustics for abundance and biomass estimates of mesopelagic organisms. And I think this example from a paper we published in 2020 serves as a good example of why that is. During the project, we have consistently deployed autonomous echo sounders on our trolls, looking ahead of the troll. A schematic and picture of the realization of this is shown on the lower left-hand side of the slide. We use data from these echo sounders to directly count the organisms that occur ahead of the trawl. Since we know the sample volume uh, from, uh, for this echo sounder, we also know the densities. The heat map in the upper left shows the densities of organisms ahead of one such trawl, registered using a 120 kHz transducer, plotted as a function of the acoustic signal strength, the target strength, and uh, depth uh, at, along the y-axis. This is a direct estimate of vertical density uh, with very few assumptions. In the upper right-hand uh, figure, uh, we see the echo sounder data recorded concurrently with the trolling, in this case uh, from a 38 kilohertz hull-mounted transducer. And uh, on top of this, uh, we have uh, overlaid the head rope path of the troll. Uh, on, on the left hand side of the echogram. Uh, next in this figure follows an overlay of uh, backscattering volumes, vol uh, values. The red line is the volume backscattering values from the troll mounted echo sounder, again at 120 kilohertz, whereas the black dotted line is the volume backscatter recorded by the hull mounted 38 kilohertz transducer. A hull mounted 120 kHz transducer would not be able to cover more than approximately the upper 400 meters of this water column. So it's, while it's okay for epipelagic studies, if the mesopelagic is the focus, then we've barely scratched the upper level, which is why submerged acoustic equipment is needed for high frequency coverage at mesopelagic depths. The final overlay uh, on the echogram shows the directly estimated densities of organisms in front of the troll. You can see that apart from near the surface, this line corresponds very well with the backscattering uh, levels of the 120 kHz uh, transducer. A couple of things are obvious. First of all, the 120 and 38 kHz volume backscattering levels are not particularly well correlated. This is not very surprising, as organisms with different acoustical characteristics will show up differently on the two frequencies. But it draws attention to the fact that the 38 kHz backscattering levels highlight some organisms over others. Secondly, organismal densities in the deep scattering layer identified on the 38 kHz data are not very high. Well, the layer with the highest organismal densities is not evident on the data from the hull-mounted transducer. So, if trolls here were directed by the hull-mounted acoustics and only sampled the deep scattering layer, they would not be catching where the highest densities of organisms actually occur. Those of you with a good knowledge of North Atlantic ecosystems and the acoustic equipment used may now argue that Okay, but uh, the shallow layer not showing up in the hull mounted 38 kilohertz data on the last slide are likely be, to be euphosids, not mesopelagic fish, and you're talking abundance, not biomass. You'd be correct, but the same principle applies also for fish components and biomass. 
And to highlight this, I'll show some data we collected during a 2021 cruise in the North Atlantic. The figures on this slide shows the locations of trawls during this cruise, and the two echograms show the vertical distribution of backscatter at 18 kHz on the left and 38 kHz on the right, plotted against longitude and depth. Immediately obvious is the fact that the two frequencies highlight slightly different vertical layers as uh, the most strong part of the deep scattering layer. But both these frequencies show little backscatter originating from below approximately 800 meters. Overlaid on the left panel is a set of lines that highlights our normal sampling st uh, strategy during mesopelagic cruises, which is an oblique troll hole covering uh, the depth region from 0 to 1000 meters. Since we don't trust the cod end samplers that are available to us, we set about investigating the vertical distribution of abundance and biomass by conducting repeated troll holes to different depths at the same station, which is highlighted in the red lines overlaid on the 38 kHz echogram on the left. Since we know the volumes filtered by our trolls, we can calculate densities down to a certain depth and subtract these values from values estimated for deeper holes thus ending up with estimates of densities per depth stratum. As an aside, we did this exercise for two different types of trolls at a number of stations. And these are the average results over all these stations, separated by troll types, that is the 134 MP and the 280 MN uh, designations. The red lines on the 38 kHz echogram shown on the left shows the approximate depth strata used. The trolls used have different mesh sizes and mouth openings, but both are ungraded trolls, and we estimated the volumes filtered by combining sensors giving us the opening dimensions of the troll with measured flow into the trolls. The left-hand graphs marked length shows cumulative relative length distributions for the two trolls, plotted against individual fish weights. These are split according to the depth, depth strata fished. You can see that unsurprisingly the troll with a smaller mesh size uh, catches more and smaller fishes. The numbers in the legend is densities per depth strata. The black lines and numbers give densities of fishes down to a depth of 350 meter. The weight stated uh, in uh, the legend here is the medium median weight of the fish. In the fine mesh troll, the 134 MP troll, the abundance peaks in the interval between 350 and 500 meters. That's uh, highlighted by red line and text with a density of 3.53 fishes per square meter found in this interval with a median fish weight of 0 0.17 grams. If we look back at the echogram, we see that the vertical str uh, strata with the highest uh, backscatter also coincides with the highest densities caught in this troll. In the coarse mesh troll, the 280 mn, the highest densities were actually registered for the str uh, stratum between 500 and 750 meters depth, but actually the densities estimated for the three deepest uh, strata for this troll are very similar. If you look at the biomass distributions, those are the panels marked weight on the right, things get a little more complicated. We see that for the fine mesh troll, total biomass levels per stratum is very similar for the strata containing the DSL and the deep uh, str uh, stratum, which extends from 750 to 1000 meters. And we also see that the overall highest biomass density was registered for the deep st stratum for the core stroll. When looking at the numbers, bear in mind that the upper DSL stratum has a smaller vertical extension than the two deeper strata. But nonetheless, if you look back to the echogram, there is no indication on the echogram that there should be high biomass levels of mesopelagic fish found beneath 750 meters. This again highlights that reliance only on acoustically uh, directed trolling would miss out on a lot of the overall biomass. This slide summarizes uh, the points I made over the preceding slides, so I won't go into too much detail. 
most of the points uh, I try to make should be understandable by now, I hope. I would like to draw attention to a couple of studies that have highlighted either a surprising amount of biomass in the deep pelagic, as in the 2008 Mareco publication shown on the right, or a surprising abundance of large organism, as in the study from Hawaii shown on the left. Management of, mes of a mesopelagic fishery on large and deep living organisms is likely to be different in practice to management of a fishery on small and more shallow living ones, such as, say, Maurilicus, as vital rates and productivity levels are likely to be quite different, suggesting that there is no appropriate one-size-fits-all approach to a management of a mesopelagic fishery. But before we can get to what and what is not possible and feasible in terms of management, we first need to map what is actually there. And for that mapping, it is our conclusion that we need to move beyond overly simplistic mapping approaches relying almost solely on hull-mounted single-frequency acoustics.